Hello, everyone. I guess we are on. Welcome to the statics and affordances of massive media. What happens when a building becomes a screen? Which is a panel to celebrate the launch of Dave Colangelo's new book, The Building as Screen, a history, theory, and practice of massive media. The event is organized by SPAL with the collaboration of Amsterdam University Press, Ryerson University, and the Media Architecture Biennale. My name is Gabriel Menotti, and I have the honor, honor to be your host today and to moderate the discussion that will be coming up in a few minutes. But first of all, even though sadly that's an online event, uh, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the land that we are in and the communities that are its traditional stewards. I'm personally in Kingston, Ontario, which is the traditional territory of, of the Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee people. And Toronto and Ryerson University are in the dish with one spoon territory. The dish with one spoon is a treaty between the Anishinaabe, the Mississaugas and the Haudenosaunee that bound them to share the territory and protect the land. Subsequent indigenous nations and peoples, Europeans and all newcomers have been invited into this treaty in the spirit of peace, friendship and respect. So today we'll be discussing the role of massive media, which role massive media can play in practices of monumentality, public art and digital placemaking and placekeeping. Some of the topics we'll be addressing include what are the critical and creative possibilities of large scale public projections, urban screens and media architecture and the technical and social frameworks connected to them. And in order to discuss these very exciting topics, we'll be uh, counting with Dave, Col Dave Colangelo, the author, who's an artist, educator and researcher based in Toronto, Canada. He's a founding member of Public Visualization Studio. He's also an assistant professor of digital creation and community and communication in the School of Professional Communication at Ryerson University and director North America of the Media Architecture Institute. In conversation with Dave, we'll have Sarah Turner, an artist, new media curator, creative producer, and art director based in Portland, Oregon, USA. Sarah is the co-founder and artistic director of the Mobile Projection Unity with Nanda D'Agostino. The Mobile Projection Unity is funded in part by the Regional Arts and Culture Council, Precipice Fund, the Andy Warhol Foundation for the Visual Arts and the Caligram Foundation. And finally, me, Gabriel Menotti, I'm an assistant professor at Queen's University Film and Media Department. I work as a curator in the fields of cinema and digital slash new media. And my most recent publications are also an ontology called Practice of Projection and a book, Movie Circuits, that was launched last year in the same series as Dave's book. Called, uh, and in order to talk about the series, first of all, I'd like to invite Marise Elliott, Marise Elliott, sorry, Senior Commissioning Editor of Film, Media and Communications of Amsterdam University Press. She'll briefly introduce her to the work of Amsterdam University Press and the Media Matters series. Hello, Marise. Nice seeing you again. Hi, Gabrielle. Thank you very much for the introduction. And thank you also to Spur and Faith and Twente for allowing us to have this uh, presentation. Uh, so yes, I'm the commissioning editor um, at Amsterdam University Press of the Film, Media and Communication Studies uh, book list. And uh, in that sense, I'm very fortunate to work with uh, authors of some exciting projects um, in my program, projects that cover a wide range of topics, going from uh, film theory to uh, media archaeology to transmedia, game culture. Um, very recently, we launched new series on um, Asian cinemas, and um, there's one coming up on green media. So at Am Amsterdam University Press, this is um, our role to always be uh, relevant uh, with timely publications. Um, and what I also try to do in my job is to find the best home uh, within our uh, growing collection of books 
uh, and by home I mean book series, book series that allow to have a coherence between um, our diverse publications. And um, the one that is very much relevant here, as Gabrielle mentioned, um, is the fact that Gabrielle and Dave have both published in the uh, Media Matters series. Uh, so I just would like to say a few things about, uh, a few words about the, the Media Matters series. It's a series that has been around for about 10 years um, with lots of publications, uh, but about two years together with um, the series editor, Nana Ferhoof, um, who I saw she's online here. Hi, Nana. Um, together with Nana, we thought uh, two years ago that it would be um, a good time to, to revamp the series, um, revamp the series in a sense that uh, it really addresses this, those practices in, in today's digital culture, technology, with the new technology. Um, so we wanted to see more books uh, addressing concepts of materiality, of performativity, um, and in that sense, that's how not only the editorship was revamped, so we now have, together with Nana, we have the series editor, Michael Blakey in, uh, in Utrecht University, um, Jennifer Patterson in the US, and Sally uh, Norman in New Zealand. Um, so we changed the editorship, but we also changed the scope or revise it a bit. And it's in that context that um, two years ago, uh, when Gabriel, uh, you, we discussed your book project that, uh, you know, when I saw together with Nana, we saw how you are expressing cinema as the medium and how crucial the, the medium that it is. Um, it was clear that it would be a, a great fit to the Media Matter series. Um, and similarly, uh, Dave, in your book, um, when you approach us, we definitely, so we have already a few books on screens, uh, but screens usually, in, you know, uh, as we all kind of think about it, uh, either cinema or a mobile device. Um, but uh, with your book coming in the series, you were really uh, filling a gap um, by showing how the medium of the building um, has also its importance, how it shapes the narratives in them, you know, a digital culture. Um, and yeah, so I just want to say it has been a pleasure working with you both, Gabriel and Dave, um, on your, with your books. I think the covers are fantastic and um, I'm certainly looking forward to, to hear you more about um, the medium of, of, of building. And uh, yes, thank you very much. Back to you, Gabriel, I guess. Hey, well, thank you, Maurice. It has been a pleasure to work with, with Amsterdam University Press. And I guess that Dave's experience has been the same as mine. Uh, Media Matters has been putting out some really high quality scholarship on new forms of screen media and cinema. And I guess a lot of it has gone straight to my course lists and to my bibliographies. And this includes Dave's book. I guess it's a really timely release especially because right now we are seeing how outdoor projection, massive projection has taken over the world due to lockdowns and pandemics. It's one of the few ways we have to experience images collectively in a somewhat safe situation. So I guess, well, I, I really mean it because I just started this term uh, course on, cre on creating screen media. And one of the chapters of Dave, Dave's book was uh, the topic of one of our uh, class discussions a couple of weeks ago. So I guess there isn't much reason to drag this introduction uh, long any longer. Uh, I'd like to invite Dave to tell us a little bit about the book right now. Uh, he'll provide us with an outline of the book. And after that, we have presentations by Sarah and me addressing some of the theory and examples that he brings in relation to our own work, which also deals with with public media and massive projections and if you want to to post any questions people there is a QA a box somewhere in your zoom interface that you can use for that i'll be taking care of them and passing them on to the speakers in the moments that we have for discussion okay but so dave are you there are you ready 
Hello. Hello. And uh, uh, thank you for all of those kind words. Now, now I get an opportunity to, to, to say thank you to a bunch of people um, before I launch into a bit of a, a discussion of where the book came from and perhaps where, um, where it's going, where the work is going now. So I'm going to share my screen now. I've got some slides for you. Okay, just one second here. All right. Um, yeah, so, um, sorry, I'm, can you, it, it, I think there's like a chat window that's on top of my shared screen that I've got to get rid of. Let me try this again. Sorry about that. Okay, so thank you to uh, Gabriel, Sarah, Marisa, uh, Lucia, and uh, the team at SPAO and Amsterdam University Press, uh, as well as to my home department, the School of Professional Communication, and the Media Architecture Biennale for sponsoring, and also to all the attendees today. I, I kind of scrolled through the list uh, and, and saw some familiar names there, and, and really, um, you know, it, it, uh, it, it really takes a village to um, to publish a book. So all of you have been uh, part of this in some way, and and uh, this is kind of a nice moment to reflect on, uh, for me to reflect on all the ways that that you've helped me to get to this point here with this uh, book publication. And so let me tell you about um, some of the things that that came before. So for me, it all it all started at Goldsmiths University, um, and this is a connection between another connection between myself and Gabriel. Gabriel did his PhD there. I did my master's there, and I took a class uh, called Screen Cultures with Dr. Janet Harvard. And as a result of that class, it just totally got me to shift my idea of what I was going to do my my uh, dissertation on there. Um, and and I went on to write my thesis. And here's some some vintage photography here from an old camera phone. Um, I, I went on to do my, my thesis on the impact of electronic whiteboards in elementary schools uh, in East London and how interactive digital displays change the dynamics of elementary education. And uh, so I actually went into the, the schools. I, I was able to um, uh, negotiate access and, and uh, worked with a teacher to develop some lessons using an electronic whiteboard and these clicker devices that uh, were basically being mandated. In, and this is the mid 2000s across the entire elementary school system in, uh, in the UK. And uh, Two things came out of this project that, that proved to be the seeds for my research for the building is screen. Um, and this was an appreciation for the impact that screens have in shaping space, identity, and social situations, uh, but also the importance of understanding these situations through participant observation or research creation. So paying attention to the, the, um, the, the, the spaces around and beyond the screens by getting involved in the actual sort of uh, social and technical networks that, that they uh, inscribe. So shortly after I moved back to Toronto, uh, I ran out of money, had to leave London. Uh, and if you've been to Toronto, you know that pretty much uh, from any uh, vantage point in the city, you look up and you see this thing. Uh, so this is the, the CN Tower, which like a lot of buildings, um, like the Empire State Building, not too far away from here in New York, and many other towers and structures around the world, were being fitted with these uh, programmable LED facades capable of color changes that would have once taken uh, many people many hours. So, uh, you know, I, with the Empire State Building, the previous lighting system required eight or nine workers, basically, it took them an entire day to, to change the lights. So that really, uh, th that was a huge shift in terms of the uh, number of lighting programs and the, and, the, um, and the resolution and the types of causes, concerns, and, and uh, corporate events that were being displayed on these screens, these buildings that were becoming screens. And so I became fascinated with the ways that dynamic displays were shaping the texture, tempo, and tenor of public space. Uh, and so you know, right in my own backyard here, the Ryerson Image Arts Center uh, was, a, was an example and actually quite similar to the Ars Electronica Center in Linz, Austria. 
And not far down the road as well in Montreal, the Quartier de Spectacle was developing long-term sustainable programming with permanent projection sites, developing new audiences and new spectatorial practices for the moving image in public space. For me, these were dense transfer points where things like monumentality, digitality, cinema, and communication converged. So this became the, the focus for a PhD that I embarked on in 2010. And I began to read into this area inspired by people like Scott McGuire, uh, Adriana de Souza Silva, Nana Vierhoof's work on mobile screens, Anna McCarthy's work on ambient television, Guy Debord and others. And I began to do research on three fronts, similar to what I'd done with my project at Goldsmiths. So I looked at the, the history of the building as screens. So here's a well-known example. Again, if you're here in Toronto, you might recognize recognize it, um, but your city probably has something similar. Uh, uh, a lighting, uh, the, the tip of the building will is animated with different colors and, and movement that tells you if it's getting warmer or colder. So, you know, we're obsessed with the weather here, you know, uh, uh, probably uh, lots of other places that are similarly obsessed with uh, if it's going to snow or rain or what have you. So this became part of this kind of public uh, life in the, in the mid 20th century, these dynamic um, uh, lighting expressions on, on buildings in highly visible uh, central places. Um, and I also engaged in case studies. So in particular, the one that's featured in the book is the Empire State Building, in part because it's such a well-known symbol, but also uh, I, I think it's the, um, the most photographed building in the world, the, the first or, or second place, I'm not sure. Um, uh, so I, I considered the building as a kind of media channel in this new form uh, because there was all this discourse surrounding it through social media channels that were part of its experience. And I interviewed curators and cultural producers like Sousa Pop um, uh, and the work that she continues to do at Connecting Cities uh, to better understand how the work is planned, produced, circulated and supported in various ways around the world. But finally, and perhaps most importantly, through making projects, and I should note at this point that I was lucky enough to connect in 2010 with Patricio de Villa, who's been my collaborator ever since with uh, what we call Public Visualization Studio. Making work actually allowed me to better experience and understand the aesthetics and affordances of urban screens, public projection, and media architecture. By inserting myself into these situations, I could learn and report on the importance of recreating elements of cinema for peripatetic audiences in public spaces. We could also create what uh, McLuhan might call uh, a probe, a cultural probe to test these extensions of our sensorium. So this project called eTower asked the city to um, submit bits of energy using their mobile phones throughout the night of Nuit Blanche in 2010. And so the more energy that we got from the city and we got thousands and thousands of bits of energy, uh, the faster and brighter the lights uh, would become the sort of moving from cold tones to warmer tones and that cycle would continue. And so there's just a time lapse of that, of that project. I might skip ahead just to show you some of the color changes here. Um, and we could, we could probe the critical and creative possibilities for things like what we saw as an emerging form of public data visualization, uh, which we did with this project on Ryerson's campus called In the Air Tonight, which uh, I'll start playing a video here. Um, it uh, visualized wind speed and direction on the building for uh, for an entire month in the winter uh, for three years we, we ran this project and anytime anyone used the hashtag homelessness the building glow red and there were a bunch of other components to this that we built on but that's basically um, the gist of it and and uh, we had a mobile device uh, or mobile interface um, that that mimicked the building as well so the work and the research has developed more along these lines for me, a sense learned from practice research and interviews that communities must be given the opportunity to engage in uh, parts of the planning, production and ongoing negotiation of the use of space and media through buildings that are increasingly becoming screens. And more than this, dense transfer points for making meaning across hybrid, uh, real and virtual networks and spaces. 
And so as the book essentially report on this iterative process of engaging in theory, interviews and research creation and so on, found its way through the steady hands of the AUP publishing pipeline, helped along the way by people like Maurice Elliott and uh, editors Scott McGuire and Will Straw that I'm uh, greatly indebted to, I began to operationalize the findings of my book in my pedagogy and practice. Now I was lucky enough to find my myself in the School of Film at Portland State University uh, just after graduating and I was there for two years and that's where I met and worked with a number of amazing people like Sarah Turner. Um, who at the time had developed a program called Nightlights, a public projection event held on the first Thursday of every month in the winter. Working with Sarah, I was able to bring film students out to consider how public projection could expand their understanding of what film was and what it could do. Let's skip ahead a little bit here. And this was just a lot of fun. We had a good time. Uh, Right there in the in the parking lot before uh, beside the regional arts and culture council. Um, at the same time, I kept working with Ryerson University's media facade to develop and launch a program called Rylights that allowed members of the community to request color changes and to extend some of the capabilities that we had developed in earlier projects to create a more diverse, inclusive, and inclusive and representative space. So this project, very similar to In the Air Tonight, um, we worked with a group called Shades of Our Sister, and instead of the building glowing red anytime we use the hashtag homelessness, it would glow red anytime anyone used the hashtag MMIW um, and these other hashtags as well in reference to missing and murdered Indigenous women, which is an ongoing uh, problem uh, here in Canada. And so this kind of work stands in stark contrast to what stands right next to this building on our campus, which is a statue of, uh, the, of Egerton Ryerson, the, the person that this campus is named after. And Egerton Ryerson uh, was um, uh, partially responsible for the creation of, um, of the residential school system, which, uh, which enacted a, a great deal of violence on indigenous communities. Um, and so, uh, What's, what's uh, I think, interesting and important about uh, the kind of ephemeral and a sort of more community engaged monumentality that a building like the Ryerson Image Center represents is that it offers us uh, opportunities that are different than the sort of uh, forever set in steel and stone um, monumentality and, and public displays of of statues, it gives us something that gives a, that offers possibilities for multivocality, for polyphony, um, and but of course this isn't you know what it, one of the most important things I've learned that is that this isn't without the work that goes into developing the protocols, programs, and channels that allow for community engagement and determination of space uh, through use. And so today we find ourselves in an interesting moment as our cities are rapidly becoming smarter. Uh, of course, they've got to put that in quotes uh, with, with even more connected sensors and screens uh, alongside a global pandemic that drives us into public spaces that, that only allow us to convene at a distance. Well, at the same time, we find ourselves in a global reckoning with respect to our histories of violence and discrimination against queer, trans, Black, and Indigenous communities and people of color. That in many ways is being played out in what I describe as massive media, both massive in size, but connected also through, through mass media and, and, and uh, media networks, the vast discursive and technical networks of circulation. Um, and so with that, I'll pass it back to Gabriel, and I'm, I'm very much excited to have a conversation with Sarah and Gabriel and the rest of you uh, on, on, uh, on this work and, and uh, some of their own work as well. Hey, Dave. Thanks for this presentation. A lot to follow up, and it's great to see the book and the background of it laid out in such a clear manner. And yeah, I'd like to invite Sarah right now to continue this amazing series of, of talks with some, some examples of their, her own work at the Mobile Projection Unit. Hello, Sarah. Hi. Pass the word on to you. Thank you. Thank you so much for uh, hosting this event. And Dave, uh, thank you so much for inviting me to speak. I'm really excited to share my work with you all. Um, like Dave had mentioned, we had met in Portland uh, probably back in 2000. 16 or 17, perhaps, and um, 
started working collaboratively on a particular night of Nightlights, um, which was a program that I ran with um, Open Signal and the Regional Arts and Culture Council here in Portland. Um, but yeah, in relation to uh, Dave's new book, uh, I think one of the main uh, sections that really resonates with the work that I do is the chapter on curating massive media, um, specif specifically looking at um, challenging the dominant consensus, um, quoting from the book, uh, of urban spaces as places of uninterrupted commercials that leave little room for negotiation or heterogeneity. And I think um, a lot of what I had seen in Portland before creating the mobile projection unit was uh, we have a lot of design firms, we have a lot of big brand companies in Portland that use uh, projection and, and large scale media to advertise um, a lot of their products. And that can be really exciting and interesting um, depending on the content, but there isn't, there previously was not a lot of room for more conceptually driven video artwork in that scale other than um, the work of Nightlights. And so uh, kind of jumping from that project, uh, one of the main things that we wanted to do in terms of growing a program of, of massive media in Portland was to be able to go to different neighborhoods and serve different communities with the artwork that we were showing and, and producing. And so um, in early, uh, I'll start sharing my screen. Um, in early uh, 2018, we began to apply for grants um, to help us get this project started. So. Uh, my collaborator and I, uh, Fernanda D'Agostino, also based in Portland, set out to develop a program that would uh, be both an artistic endeavor for us, um, as we're both uh, new media and video artists, while also uh, providing tools and professional development for other video artists in town um, to do similar work. So we were able to get funding from uh, uh, the Portland Institute for Contemporary Art, which uh, they have a really great re-granting program called the Precipice Fund, which is supported by the Calligram and the Andy Warhol Foundation, um, along with the Regional Arts and Culture Council, um, a small project grant. And what was significant about those two grants was it was uh, enough money and enough, or not as many strings attached as, as normal grants that we were able to um, do capital purchases. So we, we could buy projectors, we could buy um, physical gear that we would be able to own ourselves. And so the significance of that was we had our own mobile studio. We could um, take it around and share these tools with different artists rather than always having to find funding to rent them. Um, and, uh, and, you know, it's quite a lot of money. So uh, it's nice to provide um, tools to folks who might not have access to them otherwise as well. Um, so we got the funding and developed our little rig. You can see um, in the picture uh, on the right, um, that's, that was kind of like the early basic design of what we had. It's very simply a projector and a mount on the top of my car. And then we have a generator that provides mobile power um, for the entire system. And then um, we have a, a laptop with a uh, projection mapping software, um, specifically MadMapper is what we use. <clears throat> so we started the season um, with a, a full curatorial set of uh, five artists um, or five uh, groups of artists that we would uh, have them collaborate with each other. And so the idea is that we would have one video artist matched with one video mapper or a uh, spatialized designer in that realm so that they could both work off of each other um, in terms of the video mappers pushing their work towards more conceptual uh, video ideas and the uh, video artists pushing their work outside of the gallery and more into these public um, large scale spaces. So this, so when we first started out, we would hold these events called the Bring, Bring Your Own Content or um, around the country, there's also bring your own Beamer events, which are similar um, of that nature, but people could just bring their um, flash drives and kind of just plug in and experience the mobile projection unit in these different locations. Uh, let's see. 
So uh, one of our first curated pieces uh, and two artists that we worked with were Sabina Hawk and Victoria Walls. Um, and this was displayed at Apano, which is the Asian Pacific American Network of Oregon in East, Far East uh, Portland. And uh, this was a really uh, beautiful community art event in that uh, a lot of the work and content um, that it's, that's displayed on the building is a long-term research project that Sabina had been um, uh, researching at the city archives in Portland, discussing the annexation of East Portland and the displacement of immigrants uh, within that community. And Apano recently built this building uh, probably back in 2017, maybe early 2018, um, as a hub and center for Asian Pacific immigrants to Portland um, to provide uh, different artistic uh, uh, opportunities, but also um, just as, as a community hub for any sorts of resources for their community. And so this uh, celebration that they had was kind of a perfect opportunity to um, situate their lineage and history in the city um, and to be able to kind of hold it as a particular uh, site for this type of placemaking. Um, this next piece uh, was in uh, probably, yeah, probably December of 2019 um, with Jalisa Johnston and Megan McKissick. Uh, so all of the works that we had in that first curatorial season were loosely based around bodies and space. And uh, Jalisa is a uh, performance artist and video artist who uh, primarily uses her body as a form of expression. And um, this was a very interesting piece in that um, a lot of her work simulates nudity and, and thinking about um, uh, video and nudity in public can be uh, quite shocking and is often censored. There's been a few times previously in Nightlights where we had instances of um, uh, things getting a little risque and getting calls from neighbors telling us to, uh, or voicing their complaints, <laughs> I'd say. Um, and so that and then both um, wanting to respect the art and making sure that nothing would get canceled or, or we wouldn't be censored. Um, we worked with Delisa and Megan to, to strategically find a space um, that would allow full expression of her intention um, behind this piece. So we ended up going to a um, industrial area in Northeast Portland along the river um, to ensure that we would be able to control the audience that was there. So the folks who we invited, the audience that would show up would, would be understanding and um, excited about the work rather than uh, purely stumbling upon it and, and requesting a type of censorship. So I thought that was interesting in terms of um, space making. And then um, this next piece is with um, Ruben Garcia Marufo and Pierre Cabuccia. And this was down um, on the Burnside uh, Bridge, which is along the Willamette River in Portland. Um, and you'll see through some of these pictures, this is a common spot that we use just because it's, it's so beautiful and somewhat accessible, but the background and is really lovely with the cityscape as well. Um, this piece is called Nasser, and it was all about um, different borders and different uh, transitions through different spaces and, and situating um, a lot of ideas around uh, territories, um, particularly in reference to Ruben's line of work through, through his video research. Um, and this, this uh, spot was, was interesting. It was the first time that we had moved um, out of our car uh, rig and and became completely mobile. We actually bought a uh, um, a wagon to be able to walk a mile down the Esplanade because the only point of access is a parking lot a mile away from where the spot is. So uh, that was fun in 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 our um, collaboration of figuring out how to make these things happen truly all over the city. So um, let's see. And then our next piece. Um, 
<clears throat> was this was with uh, Sharita Town and uh, Hassan Mahmoud, and this was at Taika, and their um, new building was on the corner of uh, uh, Northeast Williams, or excuse me, North Williams Avenue in Portland, which is a um, which was a historically black neighborhood um, in the city and has been recently just completely gentrified within the last five years. And um, Pika being there is actually a really uh, beautiful monument to continue having discussions around race, um, particularly BIPOC artists in Portland. Um, and so it was really lovely to have uh, them share their space with us to be able to host this work, um, BAPE is the Black Art Ecology of Portland. And a lot of uh, Sharita Town's work is about situating contemporary Black culture within the canon of contemporary art in Portland as well. Um, and then our last piece uh, for the season of the mobile projection unit with the original uh, funding was uh, by myself and Fernanda D'Agostino. And we were asked to work with the Portland Art Museum um, in sharing uh, some of our, our projections in their courtyard. And then we also moved inside um, to different areas as well. Um, and so everything changed in March of 2020, like I'm sure all of you experienced. And from, it was interesting that our, our uh, curatorial season ended almost exactly in line with that, I think. Uh, that previous showing was literally like two days before Portland had a shelter in place lockdown. Um, and then, so we, we, you know, took a few months to kind of figure out what we were going to do, um, if we were going to do anything else with the mobile projection unit, but then we uh, were very much reinvigorated um, during the explosion of the Black Lives Matter uh, protests, um, particularly in Portland, they're very um, widespread. And so we ended up collaborating with a lot of different activist groups and, um, and were able to lend out our gear and our expertise and our, our time, um, all volunteering to help these different um, causes. And so here is a, an example of us working with Snack Block. Um, we would have weekly movie screenings with them um, to have either documentaries or um, around uh, Black uh, rights or trans rights or um, any of those types of um, references. And then here's just another example of us um, doing a screening back again at the Burnside Bridge. Um, and then just a, another thing to share um, is that recently we have been getting more commissions from institutions um, to do uh, more socially distant type of work. Um, as Gabrielle had uh, mentioned earlier in the, in the discussion, um, there's been a, you know, a, a big lack of being able to publicly gather to see art and especially to see video. Um, all of the movie theaters in uh, the US are closed right now. And so, um, let me see, I can also uh, show you a brief video too. Um, so we've been asked by different institutions to provide these, uh, let's see, turn this down. Um, to provide these different uh, experiences where people can still gather. So this was a um, this was a performance and an installation that we had set up uh, in uh, September of this year. Um, <clears throat> and this again is at the the Burnside Bridge, um, and that was one of our collaborators, Crystal Cortez, doing a live performance. Um, and we had I kind of skipped through. Oh, there you go. So you can see we had um, three different uh, stops along the Willamette River that you could walk along the Esplanade, and and there was plenty of space for people to walk around, masked up, and there was lots of breeze coming in from the river as well. Um, and then I'll just skip to the last section as well. This is the last bridge um, near the, near OMSI, which is the Science Museum in town. Um, 
And one last example was um, at uh, the Portland Art Museum had asked us to work with an artist out of Ecuador to do projection mapping um, for the Dia de los Muertos celebration as well. Um, so all that's to say is, is we've been very versatile and, and, uh, and very grateful for the opportunities that we've had, especially during these really trying times. And, and I'm hoping that um, uh, we can still continue those efforts and, uh, and work to bring moving images to folks uh, around the city and then to also provide more opportunities for um, video artists uh, in getting creative during COVID too. So maybe I'll, um, I'll stop there and if we could open it up for a discussion too. Yes, Sarah, amazing, beautiful work. I haven't seen it in movement yet. And I mean, I was taken aback, it's really something. I have a question, the audience have a question, and I'm guessing Dave also has a question since he just showed up. I think we should start with Dave because, well. Oh, no, let me go last because I already got to speak oh. for 10 minutes. So <laughs> either yourself or, or, the, uh, or the question from the audience is a good one as well. Well, so I'll do just both at the same time. Mine was more a, a, a curiosity on how you deal with audience and what's the behavior of the audience. You mentioned very briefly how in the in the many worlds piece, you try to find some place that was that kind of allowed you to control the audience so that you wouldn't have to deal with people who would be shocked. And in general, how you go about these possibilities of having anyone encountering the work in the streets or how you consider different places, different districts in the city in relation to the audience that you may find. And from the, audi from the audience, the, the question is from Theo. I hope you're, I'm, I'm saying your name right. Uh, and it kind of relates to how do we archive these kind of, mm. of media expressions? Because part of them, like the buildings themselves, they are completely out of our control. And it's even hard to think of the city as something archivable, so to say. So I think that you have a lot of very good documentation, video documentation and pictures of, of the interventions, but what other uh, dimensions of the works have you been considering when you're trying to preserve it? Mm -hmm. And I think that we can come back to this at the end of the panel because there, there's a lot there to discuss. Totally, yeah, I, I guess we'll start with um, the audience and how they interact. I think uh, there's a lot of consideration about where, because we're mobile, there's a lot of consideration about where we go in the city and, and where we choose location-wise. Um, obviously, it's a lot easier for people within that neighborhood that we're showing in to arrive and, and to see it and to stumble upon it. Um, so that, that's, a, that's definitely something that we discuss um, as a curatorial group to, before choosing a location um, in terms of who specifically do we want to be there. Um, and then, of course, we also will reach out and ask other folks to join us in that neighborhood neighborhood too, if they're able to uh, have transportation there as well. Um, it's interesting with um, the audience, the folks who come, it's really fun uh, to see the people who do stumble upon the work. And and all, every time I would say it's, it's very much this expression of like, wow, <laughs> what is that? That's crazy. Like, what are you guys doing tonight? Um, uh, especially when it's, when it's like, durational in a way that it, that it it's you know more than a few minutes long it's not just a loop um, and people will definitely stick around particularly when there's a sound element I've noticed as well too um, but yeah sometimes it's funny I mean uh, we, we talked about this a little bit on our phone call uh, about a week ago but um, uh, there are times where, where people will kind of like move in front of the projector and kind of like test out the boundaries of, of like what's going on just to kind of conceptualize in, in their own uh, relation to the work, like they'll do bunny ears or, or wave their hand or whatever, um, which is I think is like interesting. It's, it's them getting uh, normalized to the situation. Um, and then I would also say there is actually a 
Yeah, I mean, for the most part, I would say that people are very excited and very interested and engaging in the work. But there have been a few times that people have uh, had interesting reactions. I think one of the things that comes to mind is um, that first piece that I showed at Apano. Um, the building there was uh, is both a community center, but it's also an apartment building. And most of the most of the folks who live there are Asian Pacific um, immigrants. And, um, and so the whole celebration was for them and, and um, talking about their history within the city. But there was one person um, in the building who was really not pleased with, with us projecting on the building. And they actually put their TV in the window to kind of like reflect or to give us media back, which I thought was really interesting. And it was just like a football game or something. Um, so there, it, I thought that was really cool. We, we were only there about an hour or so, so I hope we didn't bother them too much, but, um, but it was, that was an interesting conversation of, of, uh, almost like fighting media with media too. Um, yeah. And then I'm, I'm sure I, I would be really interested to know from you all too, but in terms of archiving this type of work, I think part of part of what we like about it, it is that it is temporal and um, ephemeral and, and that it it's a thing that you do have to be there. You do have to come um, and participate with the other audience members that are there, like going to the cinema. Um, and I think a lot of what we've been building into our practice is, is to do more documentation, especially uh, video documentation um, of the work uh, to be able to have it online and share it in, in that way. Um, but I would say normally we only do uh, like one pop-up screening of each event. There, there have been a few times where we've done it consecutive nights, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, Tium just responded, the building talked back, which is an interesting way to think yeah. about it as well. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, uh, I think, Dave, uh, you? yeah, I just want to jump in. I, I, I love that uh, example of, of the building talking back or, or the, the sort of uh, signal jamming that, that can happen. Or as you said, that, you know, when you, when you take the, the means of, of projection and you, and you take it out of the projection booth and, and uh, relocate it to a, a space where people can interact with it, all of a sudden it, it uh, brings, brings to light the function that, that hiding it played, but then also the, the possibilities and the potentials that not hiding it and, and making that open and, and uh, open to manipulation, um, you know, what that means. And I know Gabriel talks about that. And I see we have a question from Francesco Cassetti and I have to say that uh, I, I should have mentioned his book on uh, the Lumiere galaxy because uh, there's a lot of his writing about the relocation of cinema that, yeah. that basically this whole practice brings to light, you know, um, the, the, the how, and exactly what you were talking about in terms of how the audience is, is, is prepared or not prepared, right? That becomes part of the work. You actually have to recreate cinema anew each time you, for each project. Uh, it's unique to each project, and it's amazing to see the variation and the experimentation that that happens, and the sort of uh, innovation that happens because of that. Um, so that's what that's what uh, sort of came to my mind. In terms of archiving, with with my own work, um, I think we struggle with that. Uh, <laughs> Because we, we, you know, we find ourselves uh, barely uh, getting the work together in the first place by by certain deadlines, and then after that, we're exhausted. And and we're lucky if organizations that we work for have their own forms of archiving. And I think that's that's really useful when you work with an arts organization like you have, Sarah. Um, that that they sort of bring that infrastructure with them and that sort of ability to 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 save and preserve the work in certain ways. But I don't know if there's any sort of um, you know gold standard for that yet. I think that's still being uh, determined. Whether it's you know three D scanning an environment, uh, you know there's there's so many bits and pieces and 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 putting those together is is an artistic endeavor in itself. I think definitely. I actually found it very funny when, when Sarah said that when people started just interrupting the projection, that was a kind of normalization because 
it's the opposite of what we would expect in terms of how you should treat projection, at least in cinema, right? The normal is not really to interrupt it in any way, it's just to stay away so that the image can form properly. And I think this goes back to this idea of having to create cinema anew when we move outside of cinema's standard structures. Uh, I'll, I'll pass on to, to the panel the question that Francesco Cassetti did. I think it's also something that we can discuss a lot, but I'll just yeah introduce it right now so that we can also think on it. I think it, it relates to how media affect our notions of architecture in, in a larger sense. But he says in a, in a quote, you focused on media facades whose long history has been reconstructed by Craig Buckley. To, act, to what extent massive use of media facade changes the sense of the building, the relationship between interior and exterior, passers by mobility, and so on. And ultimately, if you look at the full set of denotations of the word screen, which functions do media facades play beyond displaying images? Yeah, yeah that, there's, I, a, there's a lot to discuss there. Sure, yeah. Um, I think, yeah, it's interesting. I think the building as a screen and in a lot of the works that we had done in our curatorial season um, definitely had either um, uh, geographic community significance or historical significance in the community and not necessarily um, the architecture itself, but just the physical presence. And I think that that positioning those works there um, on the outside for people to see um, as public art was definitely um, uh, a huge component of the artwork itself. I think that you know showing it in a gallery space inside is both limiting in terms of um, the, phys the visitors who actually go in, but also um, uh, to display it like on the corner of Northwest Williams um, was almost like a like a placing a monument in that neighborhood in that it is public, it is massive, and it is like uh, directly combating the conversation of uh, gentrification that's been going on in that um, uh, neighborhood. But yeah, I don't know. I mean, Dave, uh, do you have more experience with, with the uh, specific architecture of spaces or how do, how do you approach that in your work as well? I'm wondering, Gabriel, do you, did you have any thoughts on this? I want to give you a, a chance to chime in. I don't know. That's, that's actually a very good question. I think that the light itself, the luminous quality of the projection kind of creates this more hospitable space, right? Just like when you have a street that used to be dark, suddenly it's illuminated, which can lead to practice of gentrification, on the other hand, you know? And I also think that perhaps it, in a way, relates to this affective dimensions of being connected. Just like even though we don't really need to be checking internet all the time, it kind of creates a feeling of of respite, of, of tranquility, if we have our mobile media at hand, maybe to have screens and projections going on the public space also creates the same feeling that the city is connected and we are connected to the world through the city. I don't know, in, in that sense, it has more of a emotional effective effect as well. But this is from yeah. the top of my head right now. No, no, I think that's it. To build on that and, and thinking of uh, uh, Francesco, because I mentioned that, you know, the, the denotations of the word screen, right? And thinking about, you know, what does that, you know, what could that mean, you know, screening something, you know, does it, does it, does it um, dematerialize space, you know, in a certain way? Does it distract? Um, does it, uh, or, or as you were saying, Gabriel, does it, um, uh, does it then become uh, something of, uh, you know, city branding or, you know, this is, this is uh, a, a sufficiently advanced uh, civilization here, right? We've got these, these uh, you know, full scale LED facades integrated into buildings. And um, so I think, I think that's a good point of, of um, 
of discussion there as well between the kind of uh, distracting and covering up uh, that that a screen can do um, versus this idea that it can that it can screen something that it can express something. So uh, in the book, I talk about um, this concept and it, and it comes from uh, Jonathan Crary. Uh, um, or sorry, no, I think Sean Cubitt, uh, he talks about dehistoricization and rehistoricization. And so, uh, and that gets back to what I was saying about the difference between the sort of stone monument and the, and the, and the sort of digital monumentality that screens can provide. I think it's a different relationship to, to history in a sense. And there's that kind of screening that happens that we actually can, can cover and recover uh, many times many stories and perspectives and in a way we lose this sense and probably for 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 good reason this sense of a sort of solidity of capital h history um and and that that now is sort of uh something that that we found in in lots of other forms of media but now it now it enters the the architectural sphere it are it, it enters the spatial sphere um, with with the spatialization of media through through these types of displays, so that those are kind of, those are my thoughts. That that was a really good question that got me thinking about that, and and I'm not sure if that's what uh, Francesco had in mind, but uh, that's what that got me thinking about. Great. Do you have some feedback for us, and some that we can expand on talking about how documenting and archiving. Uh, public screen practices can can learn or or maybe be compared to archiving net art and early web work but perhaps we can come back to this in the end of the panel because it's expanding a lot of our on on our conversation i wonder if i should just go with my very few examples right now and then we can just feel freer to talk yeah, that would be great. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, my idea was just to bring some, as I said, some examples that kind of connect to the tools and concepts that Dave works in the book and see how they, these concepts can be applied beyond massive media per se. And in a sense, how they are really, really useful in terms of understanding our current media environments. Uh, bear with me for a second while I try to share my screen. Here we are, I think it's working. Anyway, and the first thing that I wanted to mention, going back to some of the work that Shara showed, is how projection itself, perhaps more than the screen, is really intrusive and it has this ability to alter our relation to space. It disrupts and creates new territorial boundaries. And it kind of allows a symbolic and, in a way, material occupation of remote and inaccessible spaces. And the example that I wanted to, to show you in regards to that, which I think it's very illustrative, is this old project by Julius von Bismarck from 2008 called Image Fulgurator. And it's a device, and it's a shame that the pictures are not a me right now, but it's a device that's like uh, a small hacked camera, DSLR camera, that instead of taking pictures, do projection. And it is connected to a flash, a camera flash that shoots automatically when other flashes shoot around it, which means that when you are in a situation where other people are taking pictures, you can simultaneously project something into the space they are photographing very, very sneakily. And yeah, it's, it's a shame that suddenly my internet became really, really slow. But what I wanted to show with this example is how by doing that, Julius is using this kind of estradiegetic montage and, and juxtaposition of the real world and, and symbolic images. And in a way, I think that they've, analyzes very well how projections in public space can draw from this sort of media um, techniques in order to reevaluate and re-represent how the city and, and uh, 
public environments are feedback into our collective memory. The work that Julius does is really out. It's really political in a way. And here's just an example. I won't try to show much stuff, but this is a talk by President Obama. And this small cross that you're seeing here, it's normally not, shouldn't be in the picture. It's not in the real space. But once people start taking pictures of it and shooting flashes, uh, Julius device, which is this strange camera, uh, shoots as well and projects this still image in, in the in the space and people start documenting something that is not really there. And I think that one of the most interesting things about these public interventions is how they are meant to be feedback into this sort of larger network of public information and public images. And as that's they've said, there is this contrast between the historicizing and historicizing public space which can also be extended to a, a conflict between generating further opportunities for dissent, making the public space more democratic, but also further commercializing and colonizing it. Since projection is mobile and projection can be kind of displaced and, and installed everywhere, uh, this allows capitalism to just spread as fast as it can. And it's, again, just a shame that my internet is not working that well today. I'll just open all the websites that I have here to make things easier for me. Uh, but this is something that just happened a couple of weeks ago. Disney Plus was just released in Brazil. And they had this guerrilla stunt in Rio de Janeiro. And they projected for a long time the logo of Disney Plus the streaming service, along with scenes from Disney films at the Sugarloaf Mountain in Rio. And here you can see a little bit of it. And as you can imagine, you need really powerful projectors to do it. So it's not anyone who would be able to, who would have the means, the resources to do it. And besides that, you also need public authorizations from the government. And this is not something that easy to negotiate. It was a controversial stunt. Some people were not happy about it because of how it creates light pollution. It disturbs local fauna as well. But in a way, that's perhaps what Disney wanted, some controversy to make the, 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 the arrival of Disney Plus in Brazil even more polemical and, and talked about. And I just wanted to very quickly compare what they are doing here to other marketing uh, or the marketing and design solutions that try to appropriate the Sugarloaf Mountain as a symbol and in doing so connecting whatever they are representing to Rio de Janeiro as a brand. Of course, my examples are not opening right now, but uh, one very, very illustrative example is the Rio Festival, Rio Film Festival, which has the Sugarloaf Mountain in its logo, kind of discreetly, but also the Olympics logo. The 2016 Rio Olympics also had the Sugarloaf Mountain as part of, of its inspiration. And supposedly they kind of show the mountain uh, in the shape of the logo. And I guess that the, the contrast that we can we can trace here is how these other branding interventions, they refer to the mountain and they make a claim to be connected to it symbolically. Whereas what, what Disney did, it, it, it invades the mountain itself and it kind of claims the physicality of the mountain as part of its brand. So in a way it can be a much more violent uh, occupation of space and it wouldn't be possible to be done without projectors. It would be possible to just, I don't know, install a huge uh, LED panel or a huge billboard in the Sugarloaf Mountain because then you'd have a good case for just interdicting the, the marketing intervention in any, in any court because this would supposedly really disturb local fauna and 
so on. But with the projection, we are in a sort of gray area and we can't really know how damaging it can be, how much it will affect and which traces it will leave in the space. So in a way, it's, it's, it's also very, very useful for this kind of takeovers, corporate takeovers of, of the landscape. And I guess it's something that has been doing, that's been done since before the pandemic uh, for political reasons as well. I had some other examples here and I think I'll just forget about them right now. It was kind of hard to find them because if you look for protests or demonstrations and projection, you find a lot of examples nowadays. But the examples I had are from Brazil, from 2016, especially. And I don't know if you know about it or if you remember, but at the time we had a contested impeachment of our president, Juma Rousseff from the Workers' Party. And we had demonstrations both against and pro the impeachment. And all these demonstrations were using projections. And I think that's a good example of how the use of projection can not only be the sort of activist tool to broadcast a message, but also to make whatever you were uh, representing with this message, with this demonstration more legible, because from a certain scale, from a certain distance, the demonstrations themselves, they are not really clear, they cannot be decodified. You have all these people on the streets and what exactly do they mean? Once you start projecting messages, slogans and images, uh, you, you kind of connect a certain meaning to this mass of bodies. It's harder to just uh, reinterpret them through media circulation. And perhaps this would be my final comment, like how these images, how these projection interventions, even though they are situated, even though they are very much connected to the space where they take place, they are meant to be desituated. And I think that uh, Dave does a very good analysis of them, a very apt analysis of them by comparing and showing how we can understand this kind of afterlife of public projections through Hitler Stell's concept of post-production, because even though we are doing something in a building that's right here in front of us, we are expecting this image to circulate and kind of create a presence of this building of this message throughout the whole world. And I think that the wow effect that, that Sarah just commented also plays a huge role in that. Because even when we are not directly uh, hoping that the audience engage or interact in any specific way with the projection, a lot of the times we are expecting them to act as further channels to make these images circulate. And I guess that's also a way to understand how public media and massive projections, even though they are located very much in specific spaces, they have this sort of networked and global aspirations. And I think this is from, from the outset. I think that in, at some point in, in Dave's book, he mentioned how the CN Tower in Toronto, as soon as they, it got uh, social media accounts, it started posting the different views of the tower on it as well, which gave the, the tower this worldwide public presence. And I think that's interesting because right now it, it, it becomes a way to inscribe in the skyline of the city, in city views, uh, part of the history, part of whatever is going on, the, the mundane or the everyday dimension of political struggles. And this is just a, a final example. Thank God I had preloaded it. This is also from Brazil. Uh, in Brazil, in Sao Paulo especially, you have buildings with these huge sidewalls. And nowadays it's, it's against the law to use them for traditional uh, advertisement. I think that for 10 years now, which also makes Sao Paulo a mecca of, of public projections in a way. And this was done by someone, not exactly a, in a professional 
capacity, so to say, and they are projecting a discussion that was streamed on Instagram, which was a way to promote uh, certain topics re regard related to the current elections. We are going to the second round, the runoff elections uh, for mayors in some towns in Brazil, especially some, particularly São Paulo, for example. And here you have massive media being used to create an other forum for for political discussion and, and political uh, demonstrations strongly connected to the internet. The final example I had was this, I hope it will open, but this series of images from Projetemos, which is a network of people who are working in Brazil and, and projecting and promoting public projection as a form of, of political demonstration. And it's fun to see after you have uh, the whole timeline of their account, how it kind of became becomes a calendar of political struggles in Brazil. Because each of these projections, each of these posts, they are connected to specific things that took place in the media and people are responding to them. And they are inscribing these responses in the city itself. And I think that these secondary dimension of public and massive media is perhaps as central as the physical experience, the located experience of it as well. And I believe that Dave's book is an amazing companion to kind of understand and evaluate how this will create new forms of media representation and political uh, action. And I think that's it. Sorry for the problem with my files and, and my internet, but uh, thanks for your patience. Gabriel, I thought, you did, I thought you did an amazing job without the images. You, you painted a, a very detailed pictures of those, a picture of those examples. So, so thank you for that. That was really good. Great. And uh, I'm just trying to go back to the Q&A here <clears throat> and my Zoom is kind of not responding very well. It's also interesting to hear, uh, you know, especially you've got so much experience with the Brazil situation, especially Sao Paulo, that there are real sort of regional differences uh, that have to do with policies in terms of, uh, you know, uh, the, the legality or illegality of, of setting up a, a projection. Um, uh, and then, uh, you know, in Portland with the bridges and, you know, I think Sarah looking at some of that work, it looks like it's... Uh, perhaps um, uh, strategic in that you're, you're under the covered bridge, there's a, there, there's a bit of comfort that's created there. So again, you know, what, what qualities allow us to, to recreate cinema and we often take the path of least resistance or find comfort as, we, as, as the cinema tries to create comfort to, to recenter the audience, especially in public spaces where there's so many other distractions. And Sarah, you mentioned sound is a big, is a big element of that. And, and I'm sure that's the case with uh, the examples that you showed, uh, Gabriel, especially some of those talks that were projected. Um, so, so that there, there's really interesting sort of comparative analysis that could happen amongst sites and, and that gets into specificities of architecture and policy. And it's all, it's, it's all very uh, complex and interconnected, but yeah, it was good to hear about that. I have a question um, based off of your talk, Gabrielle. Um, it's really interesting to see so much of the work around protesting and I appreciated your comment on uh, uh, being able to see what the protesters were protesting about by having the projection um, as kind of like a focal point. I hadn't considered that before. Um, but I'm wondering, and maybe maybe both of you can speak on this too in terms of your research and um, experience. Um, one of the things that um, I have tried to avoid with the mobile projection unit is to have it become a propaganda machine. And I think that um, the way that we kind of stay in that line is to focus on things that are, are, are not necessarily just like blasting um, uh, phrases or, um, you know, posters of that nature. And I guess um, a lot of the examples that I've seen have, have, have been for um, pro protesting pro-marginalized communities in order to situate themselves within the larger community. Um, and, and gain more rights. But I'm, I'm curious, especially as things are 
developing online and how we're seeing that um, being compared in uh, um, uh, projections in real life too. Um, if, if you have seen uh, more, I guess in, the, in America, we call it like alt-right or um, more hate groups um, using the same tactic and, and what your thoughts might be on, on that too. Well, it's one of the reasons why I tried to show one example of a pro-impeachment protest that uses projection, because at the time the impeachment was kind of forced by our extreme right or a coalition between the right and the extreme right. And a lot of people saw it as a coup against the government. And in a way it kind of led to our current government for a lot of reasons. So uh, it, can cut both both ways in a way, uh, but it, overall, my my take on it is that at least this kind of networked dimension of of protests, which kind of rely on sharing images on social media, especially right now when most of the people are just projecting from their own windows and creating a presence for these messages by yeah creating Instagram account Instagram accounts or, or sharing them with the world, that's more connected to specific resistance struggles from the left, so as to say. Uh, at the same time, in Brazil, we had panelassos, which is basically everyone banging on their pens when there is a public pronunciation on the TV by the government. And this is something that also started during the Dilma government, so during the workers party, workers party government, and it was a way of people who were against Dilma at the time, so right-leaning people, to show their discontent and create a sort of local channel for another sort of public discourse. Even though you had the official communication, the official declaration of the president in every TV channel, if you went outside of your house, you'd hear pens clamoring all over. And I hope that makes sense. But this lately has been a tactic appropriated by the right against, our, by the left, sorry, by the left against our extreme right government. So in a way there is this sort of fluidity uh, and perhaps the only pattern that I can see is how it's in a way anti-establishment, it's anti the government. And of course, I don't mean to say that there is anything inherently emancipatory in that, but perhaps there is some, some static traces that we can kind of devise. Maybe this use of very, very clear slogans is something that connects particular forms of projection to political propaganda. And that again goes any kind of, of political inclination you might have. I think it might be a, a good way to uh, build on on the, the question and what you've just said, Gabriel, to um, looks like there was a question because this is being uh, this is live on YouTube as well. And so there's a question from YouTube about um, whether this uh, these these forms are becoming an amplifier of one way communication. It's a theme that we've talked about quite a bit here in terms of um, uh, you know, putting the means of projection in the, in the hands of artists. I know Sarah, that's, that's, that's your mandate, right? Is, is there, there's two mandates to sort of spread, uh, you know, some of these messages to audiences that might not get access to them. And especially in this pandemic time, but also to, to put, uh, give the tools and the techniques and training to, to artists or maybe even more than artists, you know, uh, beyond artists themselves and, and citizens and, uh, you know, non-artists finding ways to get them involved in, in these. And of course it, it, it has to do with who owns the building and there's, there's corporate elements there. Um, I know uh, I see Zach Meltzer's name here. He's done some really interesting writing on the history of Times Square and how the history of these, these spaces um, actually, uh, uh, you know, things that happened, you know, 50 years ago, uh, sort of reverberate in, in the, the sort of protocols and the possibilities for, for these kinds of um, expressions. But maybe just kind of this larger question about the debate between democratization and commercialization between sort of, um, you know, uh, 
potential forms of, of fascism here, right? You know, of, of sort of uh, taking over uh, space and and prop and creating propaganda versus maybe more more nuanced and more um, uh, sort of grassroots approaches. So I wonder if we could talk about that a little bit. Sorry, do you want to start? Sorry. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I guess to further your your point, Dave, I think um, again a big a big part of um, what we wanted to do with. The mobile projection unit was to give tool put tools in the hands of artists and again to train them through professional development and i think that um we've been very strategic about the folks that we've worked with um and partnered with in terms of just both individual artists organizations and activist groups too um and again the content that we're showing um it's it's my hope through the work that we do that nothing that we show um is you know, banging over the head of, you know, think this, believe this, do this, um, but to have more nuance to it. But of course, you know, the more people that we show how to do this, the more uh, agency they have in, in enabling their messages in, in the city to, um, you know, I only work with people who are trying to create beauty in the world, not hate. <laughs> so I hope that that message translates onto them. But um, there's definitely, yeah, I mean, I, I find that the work that I do is very guerrilla in terms of combating both commercial um, and uh, yeah, mostly, mostly commercial work um, in that realm. And that uh, a lot of what we do both in the democratization of the tools, but also of the space, um, there's very rarely a time that we get a permit to uh, project and except in instances where we work with institutions and of course when we are projecting on um, private spaces um, we'll ask the owners of the home or, or the building but um, generally in public uh, it's kind of free game and so um, I don't know I mean I think that's again it, it works for our purposes, but it's also, yeah, this delicate line between like who, who is allowed to do that and, and wh who, what are they allowed to say in those spaces too. Do you all have thoughts on that as well? I have to say that even though the examples and the narrative I brought was very much connected to the sort of more obvious and loud uh, propaganda approaches, I'm not that fond of them. And I think that the possibility of creating spaces for public encounters is already a very strong way of using projections as a form of, of creating new political configurations of, of the city. Um, yeah, I think that that's that's a, not what I'm seeing right now very much, perhaps because of the pandemic, and we can't really meet anywhere. Um, another thing that I might comment is that in Brazil, especially since projectors, beamers are still kind of expensive, uh, people normally organize themselves in collectives or networks in order to use this equipment. So even though, yeah, they are kind of megaphones, they are kind of very authoritative in the way that they kind of impose light or impose a certain message, uh, there is a degree of collectivity in the way they must be mobilized in more precarious contexts. But yeah, I, I think in the end, I think that the making bunnies in the projection is more politically interesting than projecting some slogan. I think that's my take on that in the end. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, I, I like that you brought up the um, the term authoritarian because this is this sort of, you know, a question with all technologies is, you know, technological determinism or is the technology itself authoritarian or is it is it shaped through through social practices? And I think, you know, if, if there's anything that that I've taken away from the work that I've done so far and, and you know, listening to our discussion, it's um, it's that uh, you know part of our work is as is as kind of uh, as activists in a way to to create channels and open spaces 
uh, and try to shape the medium in, in hopefully non-authoritarian ways. And, and I think the question about, okay, well, you know, to what degree do audiences get to decide uh, if, uh, whether they have the thing or not. I love Sarah's example of the, the person turning on their television in a form of protest against it. Um, and thinking about, you know, is there, is there a future of, uh, you know, public screen trusts, right? Where, where we, we think about um, distributing the, the power of uh, decision-making about who, you know, what, what are the messages and how are they, how can they be uh, used and digested? I think, of course, part of that is happening anyway, as uh, Gabriel, as you were saying, in this idea of post-production, that the buildings are, uh, th that, that these works are, are meant to be photographed and digested through social media, and they're appended with, you know, different thoughts and meanings. Um, you know, the Nelson Mandela example in the Empire State Building, lots of people celebrating. There were a few comments there about people saying, well, you know, we should be, uh, this is, this is preempted. I think, uh, uh, I think something like Patriots Day, or there was some, some sort of American holiday that usually gets celebrated that day. So just, you know, seeing how there, there's these, um, there are channels for, for dissent and for, um, uh, for uh, dissensus, let's say. Um, so, so how do we hold that uh, you know potential for dissensus. How do we how do we uh, incorporate that into the practices? And I think that's an ongoing challenge. I don't think we we have good answers to that just yet. But that's the that's almost like a question that sort of drives a lot of the work of taking that that begins with taking the the projector out of the booth, right? That begins with sort of uh, you know allowing for this kind of messiness and this kind of uh, uh, questioning and play and and protest and and um, uh, openness, I think, of the system is is what's kind of interesting and exciting right now. Yeah, that's that's a really good point, and perhaps one uh, undeniable uh, contribution of of these pr practices to our general understanding of the world is how they make us reevaluate what cinema is and what cinema can do, and maybe see well, in a new light, the ideology of the apparatus, so as to say, to go back to very traditional concepts here. And perhaps expanding on that, there's another question from the audience by Matthias Wagner. And I quote, I wondered in what way the video artist is tied to the flat screen. Can it become 3D and still tell a figurative story, which I guess, kind of addresses a little bit how this specialization of the film using techniques such as extradiagetic montage can be used for more traditional storytelling cinematographic formats. And I don't know if you have any examples of that to share with us, which perhaps kind of apply techniques of multi-projection installation or installation art into public and massive media. Yeah, um, there have been, uh, I mean, a lot of what we do is, is uh, try to do multi-channel spatialized installation with the public projection. Um, I am not myself a 3D artist, but we've worked with a, a couple folks who, who do more 3D graphics and we've projected it that way. Um, but it is, uh, there's two ways to come at it, I think, where it's, um, Either the, I think what is more, um, uh, what works better for site specific 3D works is to have the site first and then to create work for it um, rather than the other way around. Although that is, um, that is possible too. But I will, f I will say that it's, it's, it's really difficult to, um, uh, convince video artists to show their work in that way, especially when they're really um, obviously very tied to the work that they created and, and in the format that they created it for, which is to be inside of a cinema or on your screen that you see it in the 16.9 in a dark room with no other um, distractions or ambient light or ambient sound or, or all that. Um, and so uh, there have been a few instances where we've uh, had work in a courtyard with, with three um, uh, different walls that we would project on. And we had to have this whole uh, 
uh, design discussion about which piece would go where and what what uh, abstractions we could take out of the video and how we could place them to tell this greater augmented reality story too. And so, um, yeah, it's in terms of, you know, different things that are, that are not entirely flat too. There's been a few times that we've worked with domes, but that's, that's a little maybe outside of the realm of this conversation, but, um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, have, have you guys experienced that as well in terms of looking at either the site or the or the work first and and how to spatialize that differently and uh i think um yeah. i have lots to say but i'm i'm mindful of the time here i'm looking at at the time and i think uh i think that's kind of the at the end of our the time frame for our our talk but um i wonder if we can uh uh, I guess our, you know, people can find our our names and emails somewhere online, and and maybe we can continue that discussion, because uh, there's lots of good questions here. And of course, you know, we we, we have uh, we don't have enough time to get to all of them. So that's our call to to wrap up, Dave. I think so. Yeah. Okay. So well, <laughs> thanks everyone. Tiung had another question, but I think that we will leave it hanging. It was about how projections can use to readjust statues, but well, in our next panel, perhaps we will be addressing that. <laughs> Thanks so much, everyone. Thanks, Dave, for the invitation. It was really a pleasure to be here and be able to connect with you all about this really amazing book. Sarah, it was a pleasure to meet you. And Marie, it's great to see you again. Thanks very much to everyone at SPAO and Amsterdam University Press, Ryerson University, and the Media Architecture Biennale for the support of this event. And yeah, please contact us and get the book. It's a really good one. I think that Lucia had, had a, a discount code. This would be the perfect time to, <laughs> to promote it. Otherwise, I guess we'll have to post on the YouTube link. Uh, or perhaps you can you can reach Dave to ask him for the discount code on the book, the building as screen. Yeah. And yeah, <laughs> thanks very much, everyone in the audience as well for your attention and your questions. Have a nice. Thank week. you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.